Acts chapter 16. Have you found that? I say I gave you plenty of time. I was up here running my mouth. So, All right, Acts chapter 16. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture in verse 22 through 30 this morning. Probably familiar to many of you today, uh, but want to look at the topic this morning of thanksgiving in stocks and bonds. Now, uh, you look at the picture this morning, and of course we know the story of Paul and Silas here in prison. You wonder, how can you be thankful in that situation? Well, look at a few things this morning. Hopefully just to challenge us, encourage us again to have a, a, a thankful heart, a grateful heart, especially during this time of year. So if you found Acts 16 and you're able to this morning, would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word? If you don't have a Bible, we'll have it up here on the screen here for you, and you can follow along there. So let's pick up verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But call, uh, hang on, let me get you, here we go. Am I on the wrong verse there? you got to yell at me if i got the wrong, wrong verse up there. Uh, where are we at? I've, I've lost my place now. 28, let me get you there. 28 is not on there. What happened? There it is. I, I got to go backwards. All right. And to keep the prison awake and have a sleep. Man, so, somebody needs to do my slides for me from now on. I mess these up all the time. Supposing that the prisoners had fled is where we left out. Verse 28, but Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Wow. That's, that's, a, that's a change there, right? You see a prison, a prison doors open. Most prisoners are leaving. Look at verse 29. Then he called for a light, sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What an amazing story in several different aspects. But we want to focus in this morning really on Paul and Silas, and the thankfulness and the praise that they showed even in the midst of problems, burdens, hard times. Good grief, they're in prison, locked up, and yet they still find time to praise God. And I want to look at that this morning and encourage our hearts this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness, your blessings in our life. Father, we thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the service so far, the singing. Uh, thank you for the time we've had to fellowship uh, with your people, Lord, and to lift you up even through song. And uh, Lord, it's been good to be here today. And God, I, I want to take just a moment uh, in, uh, in this prayer, Lord, and ask a special blessing on a couple of our church folks that are down and out right now. And Lord, we think of Gary uh, there in the hospital, Lord, in TMC with this heart issue and this infection. And, and God, we pray that you'll touch his body, Lord. They're talking about him being in through even Thanksgiving. And so we pray that you'll uh, give him peace and strength, comfort Nancy through this as well. And Father, we think of Chris uh, Gussa as well next door and just the, uh, the battle he's having right now with his lungs and in the heart rate, Lord. And I know uh, Heidi's concerned. So we pray that you'll give him a special blessing and healing, Lord, and uh, just touch their bodies and do what only you can do, we pray. And Father, as we uh, uh, look into your word now for the next few minutes, we also pray for you to do in our hearts what only you can do. And Holy Spirit of God, work and lead and guide. Empty me of sin and self. May I say exactly what you would want said this morning, and may it help us and encourage us, especially in this area of being thankful, Lord, I pray. And uh, God, will be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for what you do in our service. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning. I won't ask the question for public acknowledgement this morning, but you can answer it where you're seated. Uh, many folks, maybe even in this room, uh, have taken money from their uh, income and have invested it in what we refer to as stocks and bonds. Uh, some do mutual funds, some do a variety of other different things, but many people invest in stocks and bonds. Uh, they invest in that for a purpose. Uh, the hope of obviously financial gain. You want to invest in something that's going to earn you something back. Uh, but what you notice about many people when they make those investments, um, their, their future rests on those investments. Uh, what they invest in, they're hoping will carry them through after they retire uh, and will take care of them and meet their needs uh, until the Lord calls them home. But what you also notice about people who are heavily invested in things like that is this. You notice that their mood rises and falls 
based on their investments. Amen? And when the stock market goes, what happens? All of a sudden, you got a bunch of cranky neighbors. Right? A bunch of cranky family. But when it, when it, when it, when it hits up and it's going and rising and everything's going well, boy, you go, oh, my future's secure. You know, we look at Paul and Silas this morning, and of course, uh, their stocks and bonds are literal. Okay? They are being uh, uh, held in a Philippian prison cell, and they're thrust into the innermost part of the prison. So they're in the, 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 the most secure location, if you will, of the prison. Their feet are placed in the stocks. They've got chains on them. They can't go anywhere. They're held captive. But what you notice about Paul and Silas is this. Even in the middle of their stocks and bonds, they are happy. They are praising God. They are secure in everything God has done for them. Think about it. Why is that? Well, you, you really think about Paul and Silas. The, the number one reason, I think, is because they had just simply sold out to Jesus. They didn't care what you did. They didn't care what you said. They didn't care if you disagreed with them. If they were preaching Jesus, that's all that mattered. They'd been warned not to. They did it anyways. They were taken and publicly, their, their clothes were stripped off of them. They were beaten with many lashes before being thrown into the prison. But yet they had sold out to the Savior so much, they had invested their lives in serving the King of Kings, they weren't expecting earthly dividends. They were expecting heavenly, eternal rewards. They knew if we serve God now, God will take care of us later. Amen? Amen. You realize as a Christian, the, the, the retirement benefits that we have are out of this world? <laughs> Literally, Right? Now think about it. And they were trusting in that even in the midst of their problems. They were expecting eternal rewards and dividends. You know, I think about these two preachers, Paul and Silas, and I think about the wonderful impact they have for us in this story. And I ask myself the question every time I read it, how in the world could these two persecuted preachers be thankful? I mean, they had done nothing wrong other than preach Jesus. They, they hadn't uh, you know, been a public nuisance uh, they hadn't dis disobeyed law. They're, they're good citizens preaching Christ, and now they're beaten and cast into prison for that. How could they be thankful? By the way, let me take a little sidebar here. Let me give you a little freebie here, okay? I know we live in America, okay? And I know maybe in the Middle East and some of these third world countries, this, this kind of stuff still happens, okay? By the way, go to some of the Muslim countries, and, and who's being persecuted? Christian pastors in prison and killed, okay? I know we live in America, but let me, just, let me just give us a little freebie warning here, okay? There's coming a day in America where this possible persecution is real. Where even America, we can't stand up for truth and we can't preach Christ without penalty of persecution. It's, okay, it's a possibility. We, we understand that. So, so, so don't just say, well, that was just Paul and Silas. It could happen today in America, all right? But what I want to le learn and glean from these two preachers is this. They were thankful... In the midst of persecution. Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me. And I'm probably pretty sure you're like me. I do not enjoy persecution. Do you? I don't enjoy hard times. Do you? I don't enjoy when there's negative things, what I consider negative going up. I don't enjoy that. None of us do. I don't think they enjoyed it either. I don't think Paul and Silas says, yippee, we get to be beaten today. Hey, yeah, we get to go in the prison with the rats and sit for all this is exciting. Okay, I, I don't, they're not stupid, all right? But they learn in the midst of circumstances to keep their focus on the Savior, and they were thankful. How can we be thankful like they were in the midst of problems? I was in Walmart this morning. Uh, I bought, I bought, uh, we bought the teenagers some donuts and chocolate milk this morning. Yes, we have donuts in our Sunday school class. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> but uh, I was in there, and one of the cashiers was in there, and I was, I was, she was doing the carts, and I was talking to her on my way out, and we were just laughing. I had, I had a good old time with. I, I, usually the, the workers don't want to talk to you, but she was like, "Hey, you know, we're we're kidding back and forth. I'm laughing, just having a good old time for the whole 45, 50 seconds or so that we talked." And I get up there and I pay for myself in the scanner and the U-scan there. And the woman that runs the U-scan, she comes up to me and she goes, You are too happy this morning. You need to tone it down. And I looked at her and we were surrounded by every, the whole, all the U-scans were full. There were people there, there were other employees there. And I looked at her and you know what I said? I said, Shut up, woman. No, I didn't. <laughs> I said, Well, ma'am, you know what? Even in the middle of all the junk that's going on around us right now, and she's like, yeah. I was like, 
We have so much to just be thankful for. And that makes me happy. And she said, yeah, okay. (laughs) How do you be thankful in the midst of persecution? We're going to see three things that these men did that they teach us this morning. And I want to encourage us in these areas. Number one, number one, they were thankful for what God, look at the next two words, had done. Had done. I don't know how many English professors we have in here. What kind of speech is that? Had done. It's what? Past tense. Boy, a whole bunch of you. Good. You get a bunch of stickers out today. Good job. It's past tense, which means what? It happened in the past. They're, per- they're, they're, they're presently being persecuted, right? They're presently in prison, but they're being thankful to God for what he's done in the past. Well, let me just tell you something, Christian. Even in the midst of our problems, if we just focus on what he's done for us in the past, that's enough. But a good thing is he's continuing to work in our lives. Amen. But they're thankful for what God had done. Look at verse number 25. What an amazing verse. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. At midnight, they prayed and sang praises. And I don't know about you, but at midnight, I'm sawing logs. Amen? At midnight, man, I'm dead to the world. I'm, I'm snoring at midnight, all right? I'm out most midnights. There are occasional I'm up, but most of us go to bed at 7.30. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, a couple of you are like, yeah, preacher, amen. <laughs> at midnight, they, sang and pray, they prayed and sang praises. But here's the, here's the other thing I, we, we maybe skip over in that verse. It says, and the prisoners heard them. Huh? They weren't. God is so good, Paul, isn't he? Yes, Silas has been a great day, hasn't it? Man, these boys are loud. These boys would be considered obnoxious. They're praising God at the top of their lungs at midnight. Why? Well, think about it. I put down two, two quick points. They were praising God because he had saved them from sin. And they're praising God for what made salvation possible, which was the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary and the resurrection of the Son three days later. They're, they're thrilled. They're singing praises not because of anything they've accomplished, not because, hey, we got in prison for doing good. They're praising God because what God had done for them. He had saved them from their wretched past. He had changed their lives. He'd made them a new creature. He'd set their feet on a solid rock. He'd changed their lives. And you talk about a radical change from Saul to Paul. Amen. Oh, he can't use me. Oh, come on. Oh, he can't save that guy. Are you kidding me? They're they're praising God and singing and and praising his name because he had saved them from their sinful past. He'd changed their life and and salvation was possible because of what Christ had done. He's the one worth praising. And they're praising him. I don't know what they were singing in prison that night. I have no clue. But I I like to conjecture, don't you? I got a feeling at midnight they started singing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. The saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, oh, but now I see. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Uh, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is risen Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always here. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Now, I know none of those songs were written when Paul and Silas were alive. But sure, sure, it sound good, doesn't it? Amen. Whatever songs they had during those days. They were lifting God high in praise, magnifying his name as the song just sung, lifting many hands in praise, even while in prison. They praised God at midnight. Secondly, I put this down. They praised God after being beaten for their faith. Beaten for their faith. Paul and Silas were not beaten because they broke the law. They were not beaten because they had done something that uh, the penalty for what they had done was a beating. 
Okay. Now I'm a I'm a I'm a full proponent of of you know you you do the crime you you do the time right. I think that's I think that's true and maybe if we did that a little bit more in our country we might have some of the crime that we do have. Okay. You do something wrong you pay the penalty. Okay. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. That's just that's how it is right. They, they were not being beaten for something they had done wrong. They were being beaten why? For their belief in Jesus Christ. For for keeping the faith. For sharing the faith. For preaching about this good God that had saved them. How can you how can you be thankful when you're being beaten for something you don't deserve? You're being punished for something that you didn't do wrong. Right? By the way, I'll just go ahead and throw this out there because I'm such a nice guy. If you do wrong as a Christian and God whoops you, don't you complain about it. You deserve it. Amen. Amen. I deserve it. And he chastens the one he loves anyway, so I need to be thankful that he's chastening me. That means he loves me. Amen. And we have, of course, we have that parallel made then to, 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 to parents, and we love our kids, so that's why we discipline them. But the Bible teaches us, you know, if we love our child, we, take, we make sure we take care of that, right? Don't get mad when you punish me for what I do wrong. But when I get punished or persecuted or beaten or hurt for doing right, that's hard to rejoice about, isn't it? That's hard to rejoice about. How was it possible? How did these men do it? Let me give you a couple of thoughts here. I put down just two under here. I'll give them both to you at the same time. First of all, they remembered that Jesus had been beaten for them, right? The, the, the cat of nine tails Jesus took was not because he deserved it. It's because we do. The stripes laid upon him that opened up his body to where you could hardly recognize him as a human being. We deserve that, not him. And, and Paul and Silas realized that he did that. He took a beating for them. I guess it's okay if we take one for him. Amen? He remembered when, when Jesus was wounded, as Isaiah said, uh, he was wounded and bruised for our transgressions. He did, he did no wrong. Yet he took upon him the iniquity of us all and paid that penalty on Calvary. And Paul and Silas are simply saying this, we don't enjoy being beaten but man, we're being beaten and he took it for us. We can take it for him because he's an amazing God. He's a wonderful Savior. Like Jesus, let her see, they were in prison for doing good. They were in prison for doing good. Let me ask you a question. Is it ever bad to tell somebody about Jesus? I mean, is he not the answer to all the world's problems? Is he not the solution to all of our fears and troubles and heartaches and burdens? Yeah. So is it ever bad to talk about a good God? No. They're being prisoned like Jesus was, by the way, for doing good. Why was Jesus thrown in prison? Now, I know you spiritual folks are going to say to fulfill the will of the Father. Okay, that's true. He had to fulfill the will of the Father. Calvary was his destination. Calvary was the, was the plan thing ever since birth. We know that. But why was he thrown into prison in man's eyes? He didn't back down. He claimed to be the son of God. He preached, he preached salvation through faith. And what happened? We don't like that. So they actually threw him in prison for doing good. For doing good. Same thing with Paul and Silas. They might face death, but they remembered Jesus faced the cross. Uh, they were in a dark prison cell, but Jesus walked up dark Calvary. Why? For them and for me and for you. Christian, listen, I understand we look around as many times in the world in which we live and the circumstances that we face and we think, man, life is hard. Life is difficult. It's not fair. I, I don't know how I'm going to make it. This is wrong. Can I just say this? Be thankful in the midst of problems because of what God has done for you in the past. If you are saved this morning, you will never touch the flames of hell. Amen. A little kickstart there, Kim. <laughs> huh? If you're saved this morning, sin no longer has dominion over you. If you're saved this morning, you left the devil's family years ago and you've joined a new family and a new destination and a new father is yours. That's past. So in the midst of present circumstances and present difficulties, I can say thank you, Lord, because you've done enough for me just in the past. You saved my wicked, sinful soul. You put me on a solid rock. They thanked God for what God had done. Number two, I want you to look at this. 
they were thankful for what God was doing. God was doing. You say, wait a minute. Huh. What do you mean was doing? They're in prison. How are they thanking God for that? Let me explain real, real quick. First of all, they're a, they knew that God was at work in their lives. In Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, Paul writes this. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that when God starts with you, he doesn't give up on you? And when God calls you to do something, he gives you the ability to do it. And he doesn't say, oh, I can't trust you all of a sudden. I'm going to quit. He sees it through. Amen? That's our God. That's our God. And Paul and Silas knew that God is doing something. Even when we're in prison, our feet are in stocks. We've got chains on us. We can't go anywhere. We don't get to enjoy the Thanksgiving holiday with our friends. I don't think it took place around Thanksgiving, but we're here now, all right? What are we going to do? We're going to praise God because of what he has done. But, but he's doing something now. By the way, Christian, what does the Bible say? Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So when it's happening... What does it mean? It means I'm doing something right. That means God is at work. God is at work. They knew uh, that God was at work in their lives. Secondly, I, I put this down. They knew that God had called them to this place. If you go back in Acts chapter 16, we didn't read the verse, but if you go back up and look at verse number 9, uh, uh, Paul writes, uh, we see this about Paul, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man in Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. God called Paul. God called Silas to come to Philippi to preach the gospel. Now let me ask you a question. Has God ever led you to the wrong place? Has God ever taken you somewhere and said, oops, I made a mistake. My GPS was off. No. When God calls... God provides. When God calls, he knows where he's taking it and he has a purpose for it. And Paul and Silas could rejoice in the fact that, hey, hey, God put us here. Now, let me ask you a question. <laughs> when you're facing the prison in life, do you look at it as the prison of life or do you look at it as this is the place God has called me to for such a time as this? We may not know why we're in the prison. We may not know why we're suffering the persecution, but we do have to be aware and be confident of the fact that God put me in this place. God led me here. Paul and Silas can be thankful because God is doing something. Next letter C, uh, God was doing this. They had witnessed many conversions already when they had gotten to Philippi. Uh, earlier in the text, we didn't read it, but remember Lydia, the seller of purple? Lydia and her whole household were saved. God was stirring things up in Philippi. And by the way, can I just say this? When God starts stirring things up, boy, the enemy likes to fight. And when things start going well, that's when the enemy likes to rear his ugly head and say, I'm going to squelch that. I'm going to make him feel bad here. I'm going I'm to I'm twist some things here. But they're in a situation now. Yes, they're in prison. They knew God had brought them there. They knew God was working. And they'd already seen conversions. They'd already seen people coming to Christ. They knew there was a plan in all this. God was doing something. They saw in verse number 18, they saw a demon-possessed fortune teller delivered. A demon-possessed fortune teller. A uh, 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 people who made money off of this guy uh, predicting and telling fortunes. All of a sudden, they lost their moneymaker. By the way, this is not the first time this has happened in Scripture. Jesus did the same thing. And remember, people got mad at him. People got mad at him, remember? Listen, they're, they're seeing God work. They're, they're in prison now, but they're saying, hey, this present time that we're here in Philippi... God is doing big things. I think we can trust him, Paul. What do you think? Yes, yeah, Silas, I think we can trust him. Letter E, I put this down. They were thankful. They knew they were in the center of God's will. Folks, there's no safer place to be in your life than right in the middle of God's will. Sometimes it's not enjoyable because of persecution, but it's the safest place to be. They knew they were in God's will. God had led them here. We saw that already. They were doing what God had called them to do. We, we see that already. They were seeing results. We've seen that already. They knew they were exactly where they were supposed to be. You realize many times when we face the prison experiences of life, we think, oh, the, devil's, the devil put me here. Or we think, man, I messed up my life. And I, do you realize that even the prison experiences of life, God allows into our lives? And God's in control of those areas of our lives? 
And, and so instead of looking at it with the defeatist attitude of, oh, I'm in this terrible, persecuted situation. Man, I'm in prison. How about realizing this? Hey, I'm in God's will. God put me here. I can trust God. I can trust God. He's got a plan. Are you thankful this morning? Are you thankful for where you are? You know, the problems with thankfulness in many Christians' life is this. We compare ourselves with somebody else. We don't have what they have, and so we're not thankful. Well, if I only had this, I'd be thankful. We get that, and then what's the next statement we make? Well, if I only had this, I'd be thankful. Huh? Always trying to keep up with the neighbors. We spend money we don't have on things we don't need to impress people we don't really like. Huh? <laughs> are we thankful for what we have? For where we are? For what he's doing? For where he has us? Even in troubled times, are we thankful? Are we thankful knowing that in the midst of troubled times, God is still working? I, I mentioned, I think it was maybe last week, I mentioned the fact that when your friends get you into trouble, they're not there to get you out. Aren't you thankful that when God puts you in the prison, he's there to see you out as well? Amen. If God allows me to go through the trial, he doesn't leave me and say, figure it out. He's there with the light at the end of the tunnel. Hey, come on. I got a plan through this. I'll see you through. Trust me. That's our God. Are we thankful knowing he's working? There are two life-changing options we can choose from. When we're faced with these prison experiences, if you will, or these times of persecution. Number one, you can focus on what God is doing and be thankful. This is what Paul and Silas chose. They didn't look at the stocks and the bonds. They didn't look at the prisoner who th or the prison uh, leader who threw them inside. They didn't look at the jail. They looked at their God. Hard times, difficulties, persecution. They looked at their God. And what were they? Thankful. Folks, can I just say this, man? When you keep your eyes on Jesus, it is so much easier to be thankful. Don't look at the circumstances in life. Look at the God of the circumstances. So many times we say, man, the mountain in front of me is so big. Hey, listen, we got a God that can move the mountain. Where's our focus? We can focus on what God is doing and be thankful. Or secondly, we can focus on what Satan is doing and be miserable. You see, when I'm in the prison experience of life or I'm in the persecuted times of life and I focus on the enemy... I'm a miserable Christian. Oh, woe is me. Life's not fair. God's given up on me this week, right? You know, somebody else has it better. Where's our focus? Paul and Silas had a, 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 a crystal clear focus. We're in prison. It ain't fun. We've been beaten. It hurt. All we've done is serve God. We're going to keep our God, eyes on the God that we serve. See, it's a life-changing decision. What we choose to focus on will determine whether we're thankful or not. They were thankful for what God had done. They were thankful for what God was doing in the present. Let me get this last thing, number three. They were thankful for what God was going to do. They were thankful for what God was going to do. You know, I, I look at this and here's what I think. I'm thankful for salvation and what God has done for me in my past. I'm thankful that over 40 years ago, uh, I, 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 well, yeah, over 40, I'm trying to do the math in my head, that hurts. Uh, over 40 years ago, I, I met the master, okay? I'm thankful for that. That's in the past. He saved me by his blood in the past. He set my feet on a solid rock. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that every morning I wake up, his mercies are new. I'm thankful that every morning I wake up, I know I serve a risen Savior. Every morning I wake up, I know he's going to do something today if I'll just let him. If I'll just be perceptive. If I'll just keep my focus on him, I'm going to see him work today. I'm thankful for that. Amen? But you know what else? I'm also thankful because I know God still is going to do more in the future. You know, if he did nothing else for you from now until you die, it's enough already. Amen? But he's going to do more. Paul and Silas are thankful. He, he saved us from sin. Uh, he's working now in our lives, and he's going to do more. Let's sing and praise God at midnight. They kept the prisoners awake. I don't know how the gatekeeper was asleep, but he was asleep somehow. <laughs> huh? 
He's singing and praising midnight. Thankful for what God was going to do. I put down just a, just a couple thoughts here I'll share with you. They prayed and they believed. They prayed and they believe. They're praying at midnight. And somehow I have a feeling that the prayer was twofold. I have a feeling even in their prayer they're thanking God. But I also have a feeling in their prayer they're probably saying, Hey God, if you get us out of here, that'd be a pretty big miracle. You think you might be able to do that for us, God? Let's, let's do something here, God. Let's shake this place up, God. Come on, God. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. You can do anything. Come on. Huh? I got a feeling they're praying for deliverance. And guess what? When they prayed, they believed. How many times do we pray? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to pray because I'm supposed to, but I know God probably won't answer this. Why would he? Why would he when that's my attitude, right? Pray and believe. We talked Wednesday night about praying for big things. Well, we're going to pray for the little things. Let's make them big. We got a big God, amen? Pray in faith, believing. I, I put down two thoughts here about this. We can pray and believe and receive. They did. They prayed. They believed God would work. What happened? At, at midnight, they're singing and praising God, and the prison doors threw open. The earthquake happened, and they're set free. You can pray and believe and receive. Or, number two, number two, you can pray and doubt and go without. <laughs> it's up to us. That, that's, that's, that's the difference in our prayer lives right there. You pray with belief. You receive things from God. It may not be exactly what you're praying for, but you will receive an answer from God. You pray in doubt, guess what? Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. You go without. Go without. They prayed and they believed. Next, letter B. God rewarded their prayer and praising while they were in stocks and bonds. I don't know that this is really applicable, but it's just something the Lord laid on my mind. But I think too many times people feel like I can get saved after I clean my life up a little bit. Then I'll come to Christ. And the thing is this. God wants to take you right where you are. Cleanse you with his blood and change your life in his way. That's what God does. But I think even as Christians sometimes we are saved. And we feel like, well, I'll draw closer to God. Well, by the way, he says draw, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you, right? I'll draw closer to God once I get some of these other things sorted out in my life. And can I say the same thing applies for Christians? Uh, let, let him change us. Let him clean us up. Let him lead us in the truth. Let him show us what the next step is. I don't have to clean me up. I let him do that. Because here's what I know. When I clean myself up, I never get a full job done. How, how many of your kids were brought up and your mom's always just say, did you, did you wash behind your ears? Come on, come on. Oh, we got some young people. All right, there's some, did you wash behind your ears? No, but I did everything else. Well, then you ain't clean. Go do it again. Right? <laughs> you ain't clean. You missed a spot. We, it's impossible to fully clean ourselves. Do you understand that? But God can. While they were in stocks, he answered their prayer. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? He saves us while we're wicked. He cleanses us even when we try to cleanse ourselves and can't. He does all that. We need to let him. Trust him. He rewarded their prayer and praising while they were in stocks and bonds. How did he do it? Well, first of all, the earthquake, the prison doors opened, the stocks fell off, and they were free. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine this? The earth shook with a force. Prison doors flew open. All the stocks, all the chains just miraculously fell off. The doors are open to the cells and the prisoners are free to go. The Bible says in our passage that the, 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 uh, the prison keeper drew his sword. He wasn't going after the prisoners. He was going to kill himself. Because under prison law, if you allowed a prisoner to escape, that was your life that it would cost. And so he said, I might as well kill myself instead of having to be tortured by them and killed. I'll just do the job myself. And he draws his sword. He's ready to kill himself. And you know the amazing thing happens? Paul, who had just been beaten wrongfully and cast into prison by this very dude, put in stock, says, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. We're all still here. I would have been like, dude, let me do that. Huh? Let me have the first whack. 
Paul says, hey, no, 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 no. Don't do that. This was a miraculous answer to prayer by a wonderful God. Don't kill yourself. You know, I thought about this wonderful act of God on their behalf, and I couldn't help but think this. God is still going to do wonderful things for his children. You realize as believers, as children of God, we got it made, folks. <laughs> do we suffer? Yes. Is Christian life hard? Yes, I understand. But think about it. God protects his children. God fights for his children. God rewards his children when we follow him. God has still got some wonderful things in store for his children. Paul, he writes Philippians chapter 1 and chapter 3. And he reminds us in both of those chapters of Philippians that living for God right now is a great thing to do. It's smart. It's wise. But in also both those chapters, he, he reminds us the fact that it's okay. One day we'll be with him in heaven. And even if we suffer persecution on here, it's all worth it. Because we'll get to spend eternity with him in heaven. Persecution is not easy. Suffering for your faith is not fun. Being mistreated because you preach Christ is not an easy thing. But we see Paul and Silas, two thankful preachers who brought others to Christ. If you read the rest of our passage in Acts chapter 16, and you pick up by verse 27, you read down through verse 34, Paul tells that prison, don't, don't kill yourself. And you know what the rest of the story is, as Paul Harvey would say? The jailer and all of his household came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul got zero credit. Silas got zero glory for what just happened. All praise went to God. And that Philippian jailer goes down in histories and in the Bible, in our knowledge, as somebody who got saved because they watched God work through the prayer and the thanksgiving and the singing of God's people who had been mistreated for not doing anything wrong. Imagine, you imagine how different the story might be if Paul and Silas had been mad. We threw us into this stinking rotten prison cell. We didn't do anything. Didn't even put salve on our wounds and we're hurting. There's rats over there. This is, this is, huh? And, and, and so many times in our hard, our hard difficulties, we are tempted we are tempted to complain about the circumstances. And Paul and Silas says this. Listen, life's hard. You're going to face difficult times. Be thankful anyways. God has done so much. He's working today. He's got plans in the future. Live for him. Preach him. Others came to Christ even after the Philippian jailer was saved and his family. People got saved as a result of this entire set of circumstances. The question we have to ask ourselves is just simply this. Am I a thankful Christian this morning? Am I a thankful Christian? Thankful for what God has done, what he's doing now, what he's going to do. A life of thankfulness will be an encouragement to help us bring others to Christ. You ever, you ever been thankful for something and, and your unsaved friends or the world looked at you and said, what, what in the world's wrong with you? That's a hard time you're going through. How can you say you're thankful? Do you realize the impact that that has for Jesus Christ? Because it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him working through us. Are we thankful in hard times and in good times? I think we'd all agree that the hard times are the hardest times to be thankful in. But they're also the most important times to be thankful in. It says a lot about us. Let's be thankful people. Even in prison experiences, even in stocks and bonds, even in persecution, let's be thankful. Not just the fourth Thursday of November every year. I'm talking 365, six days a year. Let's be thankful. We have so much to be thankful for, do we not? Let's make sure we show it. Hey, I want, I want you all to go home tonight and at midnight. I want you all to go out in your driveway and I want you to turn on your worship music and I want you to sing at the top of your lungs about how good God is. Now, now some of you could do that and nobody would know because you live out in the middle of nowhere, Larry. You know, some of you would have the neighbors calling the police on you. You know, so I'm, I'm just kind of teasing. But Paul and Silas says, you know what? I don't care. God is good. God is good. 
Isn't he good? I think we need to adopt the attitude of Paul and Silas. I don't care. I don't care who hears me praise. I don't care who, hear, who, who hears me sing. I'm going to lift my arms in thanksgiving to my God, and I want the world to know I have a God that's worth praising. How's our focus? Even in hard times. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's been so good. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray this morning you'll take the thoughts that have been shared this morning, use them in our lives and our hearts. Lord, encourage us as your children to truly be thankful people. Lord, I know it's easy to be thankful when things are going well. Health is good and finances are fine. The job is going okay and the family's all right. But Lord, I pray you help us to be thankful even in the difficult times of life. Lord, understanding that you're still working in those times. And you've got a plan. And you brought us there. And we're in your will. Help us to be thankful for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you will do. Lord, help us to learn uh, during this week of Thanksgiving to truly be grateful. Lord, it's, a, it's an attitude. It really is. It's a heart thing. Affect our hearts, Lord. Change our hearts. May we be thankful in all things, all, all seasons of the year, in all circumstances of life. May we be thankful, I pray. May we learn from these two persecuted preachers. To be thankful even in the midst of hard times, I ask. Heads are bowed this morning, eyes are closed. Just going to have a brief uh, uh, song to close us out here. Not even necessarily an invitation, but uh, we're going to sing a, a song of thankfulness to our Lord. I would ask you to do this as we close. I'm not going to ask you if you're saved or unsaved this, this morning. message was to, to Christians actually this morning. But I'd ask you this, are you thankful? I'm not talking are you thankful when you get that unexpected check in the mail. We're all thankful for that, amen. I'm not saying, are you thankful when things are going well? I'm saying, are you a thankful person? Is that your spirit? Is that your countenance? Is that your demeanor? Even in hard times, I'm a thankful. Let me just say this, Christian. As we sing this last song, maybe you can stop for just a moment where you're seated and maybe just say, God, help me with my thankfulness. I'm going through tough times right now, and I haven't been thankful. Help me to be. Uh, maybe you're going through good times right now, and you're thinking, man, the bad times are coming. It happens. Help me to be thankful, Lord. Help me to reach others because of my thankfulness. Man, I know life's hard, but I'm so thankful we serve a God that can rise above it all. And when the giant is big, we serve a giant slaying God. Are you thankful? I trust that we'll leave here today thankful people, thankful Christians every day of our lives. Father, bless our invitation now as we sing a closing song, Lord, and we just... I uh, thank you and praise you for your being so good to us, Lord. I pray that uh, this truth today will, will truly hit home and, and we'll be thankful people, Lord. In all circumstances of life, may we keep our focus on you, what you've done, what you're doing, what you will do, knowing, Lord, that that will bring the blessings in our lives that we need. It will keep us encouraged and it will help us to reach others for Christ more effectively if we're thankful people. Help us in this area, Lord, I pray. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand together with us this morning as we close this song? Uh, we sang it earlier in the service. We're going to sing thank you, Lord, as we close our service this morning. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank Salvation so rich One more time. And free. One more time, Frank. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy grace salvation so rich and free amen let's be thankful people uh this morning this week and of course every day of our lives as christians we're going to dismiss here just have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed uh parents if you've got young folks that were singing in junior church there in the fellowship hall just so you know where they are. They are in the Fellowship Hall building right out the back door there, so you can pick them up over there. And uh, thank you for being with us today. Let's be encouraged <laughs> to be thankful every day of our lives as we go home today. Uh, Ed Thacker, would you close in a word of prayer, please, this morning?